Hello, I'm Jack Belk. Welcome to an educational project by the American Custom Gunmakers Guild. We call this an introduction to custom guns. This tape is designed for you, the customer and the shooting public, to understand what goes into and what constitutes the definition, if you will, of a custom gun. By use of this rifle and others like it, heavy guns, double barrel shotguns, single shot rifles, we hope to illustrate what goes into making a best quality gun and what, in, what is a base line of custom. We call it custom because it's made for you, the customer, one customer. It's not a run of the mill factory gun, it's not a aftermarket barrel put on a factory rifle, it's not a, just a redone military rifle even though a lot of them, including this one, started out with a military receiver. We hope to show you the parts and pieces, furniture, techniques, stock wood, explain why we do what we do, how we do what we do, and why we enjoy doing what we do. Sit back and enjoy, look at some very beautiful work. This is a good example of the American classic design, so popular now among most all of the the American Custom Gunmaker members. Steel grip cap, very lean, trim, classic. We call this classic. A classic design stock and rifle. Now we're going to try to show how we get from or to this part from the collection of parts we have in front. The foundation of this particular rifle is a military style Model 98, designed by Paul Mauser in the late 1800s. It is the epitome of the best of the turnbolt action rifles. One of the most popular designs in use today by custom builders. The metal worker is the first to work on a custom rifle. The customer usually has an idea of caliber and use and the overall look of what he wants. It's up to the customer and the metalsmith and the stock maker in conjunction to make these decisions, make these determinations and what is going to be the final result of the work put in by the two makers. The metalsmith is the first one that does his magic to what essentially is just a chunk of iron. We do discard parts, we make new parts, and we straighten, polish, and grind the existing parts. Of this particular action, a 1909 Argentine, the only real usable parts in this project is the receiver, the receiver being the main part of the action, and the original bolt, generally using the extractor also. Other parts won't be used. Let's assume for the time being that the gun that we're going to build here is a lightweight trim 270 as we showed. First stage of course is the metalsmith to grind and polish each part true with the bore line, lapping the locking lugs of the bolt in, making sure everything is correct. Parts to be added include bottom metal, made in this case by a Gill member. Custom bottom metal magazine box uh, and trigger guard be added to the action. The bolt knob will be cut off and discarded. Another bolt knob checkered and welded in place and polished, of course. Another safety to get rid of the military safety which inter interferes with scope operation or sight picture go to a completely new part made from bar stock and copies the Model 70 three position type. Center position is on safe with the bolt knob free to unload all the way back bolt knob lock, Model 70 type. Sighting arrangements may include a scope and quick detachable uh, lever release scope mounts and rings, 
scope mounts to be made and attached to the action. All of the metal parts are done. Of course, the barrel has to be fitted, chambered, head spaced, cut, crowned, polished to the customer specifications. Here we have a 1909 Argentine action that has been polished and ground. The custom bottle metal has been installed. Another bolt knob has been welded in place, this particular one not checkered. A two position safety, safe and off safe. It's actually a modified military shroud. This is done quite often. Small refinements include a pad built up on the bolt stop and finally checkered. This action, with the addition of a trigger, is now ready for the barrel. Once the metal work is completed, the next step, of course, is fitting a stock. The wood selection, some customers select their own, some select from the maker's stocks, some come to an exhibition of fine woods or gun shows and pick out their own. Regardless, it's almost always in a custom classic, an English, Circassian, thin, thin shell wallet. This stock blank represents what is actually the favorite of all the stock makers and customers. It's a Junglis Regia, or Royal Wallet, originally from the southern regions of Russia. Discovered by Marco Polo, the nuts were carried back to Europe and planted in several different countries, Italy, France, England especially, also in the western coast of the United States around California in the 1840s. Now this wood, this particular piece is cut in California, are parts of old and non-productive orchards. This wood satisfies every need of a custom rifle. It is light, it's extremely strong, it's ext extremely stable, and it has the mineral marks that are so beautiful, the dark marks with a honey background or butternut background. Depending on the area that it's grown, you get different colors, different grain, different figure. Get the little sunray fiddleback figures that you see here, plus the dark mineral marks. It's extremely stable. It's also a favorite of the stock maker because it's so easy to work. I'll demonstrate here just even cross grain you can cut off neat little curls off the cross grain of the wood. It's like carving ivory soap almost, even cross grain. It handles checkering, even very fine line checkering, very, very well. This is the custom stock wood. We show this blank as a novelty of why we lay out blanks the way we do. The owner of the stock blank is also a stock maker. He has laid out his standard pattern on this blank to show the prospective customer that there's a lot of beautiful wood here and on the bottom, of course, that will be wasted. Only the part that is finished or dark is usable wood as far as the stock is concerned. This is a standard layout. The customer, of course, has great latitude in what he wants as far as measurements, the drop it comb, drop it heel, the length of the grip cap and the, the radius of the, the pistol grip section, length of pull, everything is custom and fit to the customer. This particular blank is a full length man liquor blank. You'll notice it goes all the way to the end of the barrel. Uh, these are fairly scarce. But there's a lot of wastage in any blank. There's a lot of waste. An old instructor one time told me that there's a thousand stocks in one stock blank. There's only one very perfect stock. It's a stock maker's job to find that perfect stock and give the customer what he expects and what he wants. I will attempt here to go through the process of making a custom stock. First, the blank is selected to make sure that it's very dry 
We prefer air drying. Most all blanks made by our used in custom guns are at least three years old in air dry. You can't get too old. Some blanks are cut that are 40 to 50 years old. We know then that they're air dry and stable. The first real step is to square everything up. To square the top of the blank with one side, you've got a good level surface to work off of. You can find center lines. Then, of course, the, the big thing is to fit the customer. The customer needs to know, or the maker needs to know, what the customer wants and length of pull. The area from the center of the trigger to the center of the butt the drop at the comb, the drop at the heel, the radius of the grip. Everything has to come together to begin with in order to start. Once these measurements are laid out by geometric design, everything, everything's taken into consideration. If, it, if it's going to be a butt pad, don't lay it out long and then cut off an inch of this expensive figure. Always cut them all the way to here and then the butt pad goes on last. There's a lot to take into consideration here. Once all of this is done, center line is laid out, rough milling is done for inletting. The inletting is actually the, the letting of the metal parts into the top of the stock blank, light tight, air tight, water tight, however you want to say it, no gaps. The metal has to fit the wood. Uh, the inletting is done, bottom metal on the bottom, of course, the receiver and the barrel on top. They must be done properly in order to give the correct amount of pressure, the wood to the metal, the correct amount of, of draft. It's a hard explanation here, I'm trying. <laughs> The metal by the metalsmith is cut to make it as easy as possible on the stock maker, but the stock maker still has a tremendous job, a tedious job, of making everything fit, taking away just enough wood for the metal to, I call it a slurp fit. The metal goes into the wood with just a little bit of a push at the end. Everything is lined up, everything is perfect. Once this inletting is done, even to the sling swivels, inleted sling swivels, any kind of furniture, all of that is inleted. Then the shaping begins. Many, many times I hear people that don't know the process of stock making think or express that the shaping is the hard part to get from a square to the nicely sculptured stock. The inletting is generally regarded as much, much harder than shaping. Shaping is a process of taking the corners off, taking away everything that's not a perfect gun stock. That is shaping. Shaping should be everything a straight line or true segments of a circle. No waves, no dips, no knots, no bumps. Everything straight, square, or gently radiused in true segments of a circle. Once this shaping is done, everything is sanded or scraped to a very, very smooth finish and then a finish applied. Finishes we'll discuss a little later, but the custom rifle smith, gun maker, generally uses a hand rubbed oil finish that is a weather impervious and brings out the soft glow of fine wood. As an old instructor once said, Stock making is easy if you just remember you've got to inlet it perfectly, take away everything that's not a perfect gun stock, finish and checker what's left. It's a good bit more tedious than that. It's a good bit more, a good bit harder than that. But that is basically the process. We're back now to the original gun that we were going to duplicate by showing you all of the parts. This particular gun, again, is a 7 by 57 light sporter not engraved, an excellent job. When we left off on stock making, we had everything done but the checkering. So now we're gonna concentrate on the checkering and checkering pattern. This particular gun 
is what we call a point pattern. We refer to it as a point pattern. The checkering lines form the borders of the checkering pattern. So the lines running this way form one border. The lines running the other way form the other border. Then we've got the multi, the multi points that are formed by the checkering itself. This particular gun has a mullered border, a border made of one semicircular shaped groove. For years, borderless checkering was in, in style and showed the skill of the checker. Just lately, custom makers have re-examined some of the older guns made, especially in Europe, and found these mullered borders to be a, an accent to a great checkering pattern. Custom gun makers now, custom stock makers, are so good at checkering, there's no doubt they're not going to run over. A border is not to hide anything, it's to accent the job. You'll notice also, as I turn the gun, you see shadow lines form crossways the checkering pattern. These are formed by the shadows of individual diamonds. These shadows form a little dark, light and dark line. This is a good test of good checkering, is how straight these shadow lines are. If these shadow lines line up and are straight, that means that all of the diamonds and all of the grooves are in a proper place and a proper spacing. An excellent job overall. We'll also talk a little bit about the furniture on this gun, overall features. The bolt knob, is checkered. This is a combination of utility and appearance. Keeps a hand from slipping off the bolt knob. The checkering accents the checkering on the stock. Here we have a two position safety. It locks the cocking piece and firing, position, firing pin away from the sear, the safest of the safeties. I've always thought that maybe a safety was misnamed. These are the safest of the safeties. Custom scope mounts, here using a Leupold Redfield Burris type ring with an adjustable windage screw. The custom bottom metal, of course. Lever, the inside the bow four plate release, very popular. Got a custom trigger, an override style trigger. The military trigger has been replaced. And let's zoom in on some good inletting. Inletting, as I said, should be light tight, water tight, even air tight. The wood to metal fit, absolutely beautiful. A little aside here, you notice the tang screw slot is lined up north and south with the gun. On a fine custom gun, this is always done. The screws are always lined up north and south, even on small furniture. Going on down here, the steel grip cap, Nicely contoured, again, the screws lined up, and even the sling swivel. The rear sling swivel here is, is inletted into the stock, and then the stock is built up on a little pad all the way around as an accent. A very beautiful touch, and one that adds a lot to a custom job. This particular rifle, painting up the front, check out this four end. Good checking. Very nice, graceful point pattern. Accents the lines of the gun. And very well done. Ebony contrasting four end tip. These are strictly aesthetic. This particular gun has a barrel band front swivel. This is soldered onto the barrel. This is useful. If you do a lot of hunting in brush, brushy areas with low tree limbs, this means that the rifle slung over your shoulder, the muzzle only extends as far as your head instead of sticking up to grab everything that comes by.
a very trim, very nice job. One more thing, we'll leave this rifle and start to others. Turn it here to where we can see the butt pad. This is a steel checkered butt plate. This particular caliber has very light recoil. It also lets the stock maker show off his skill in inletting this little widow's peak area up on top. They're extremely difficult to do. And by having this sculptured steel butt plate, we have a very nice curve here that lends, leads the eye into the rest of the gun. Very trim, very nice, and very lightweight. Here we have a gun that's, while similar, it's a totally different rifle than the first we examined. This is a heavy caliber. A heavy caliber for dangerous game, and it has features and extras that you don't find on a lightweight sporter. We'll examine each of these in detail. First, notice that the magazine box or the floor plate line through here is totally different. It's not real trim. There's not a, a straight line from the fore end tip all the way to the rear tang screw. It's got this drop in it. We call this a drop box magazine. What this does is allow an extra cartridge to be stored in the magazine. This particular gun has extensive engraving that we'll get into later and, and show some close-ups, but the engraving shows what this gun is designed for. There's a rhino, there's Cape Buffalo, on the bottom there's a gold elephant. When you're hunting these type of critters, the extra round makes a big difference. The whole gun is heavier, I would judge, 10 and a half pounds, maybe even 11. It has open sights. We can see them here. Three actual open sights. One for 50 yards, one for 100 yards that flips up into place, like that. And the forward one for 200 yards. These are called ladder sights or express sights. That's the English word for it. The sights themselves are mounted to a quarter rib. The quarter rib starts out as a billet of steel. This is a metal smithing job, of course. A billet of steel is shaped and inletted, if that's the right word, to the barrel, to the contour of the barrel. A good quarter rib, you'll never see any gaps, you'll never see any irregularities in the joint between the barrel and the quarter rib. These ribs are usually screwed and soldered in place. The quarter rib not only looks good because it's traditional, but it also aids in sighting. It gives a long flat plane that runs parallel with the bore line and parallel with the sight line to help your eye immediately and quickly line up with the sights. For dangerous game, this is a very very important. Also as a barrel band sling swivel, I mentioned before the barrel band sling swivel kept the muzzle of the gun below your hat level or head level to keep it from hanging up on brush. On heavy recoiling rifles, it also keeps the sling swivel and the forward edge of the sling away from the left hand up on the fore end. So you don't have part bark knuckles from a sling. So it's also useful in that area. This particular gun has a barrel band front sight with a hood. The barrel band, traditional for this, this type of rifle, is stronger than just a ramp. It also, it looks almost like reinforcement for the barrel. It gives the illusion of extra strength. And that's what this gun has is extra strength. The hood, here protects the front sight from brush. Also, the hood is removable, and I'll try to do this. By removing the hood, we look at a fine gold bead, a little fine gold bead on the front sight. But this sight has an extra, a very nice extra. There's a secondary bead that flips up with warthog ivory. This is a night sight. 
in Africa especially, and India, a lot of hunting is done at night for dangerous game. India for tigers, Africa for leopards, right at the last fading light of day. The night sight shows up better, the ivory shows up much better than the gold, and it flips down out of the way for daytime shooting. Moving back up the gun from the quarter rib that we've already shown, this gun's also set up for a scope. These particular scope mounts and rings are of a quasi-European style. One reason I wanted to show this is because this style of scope, quick detachable scope mounting system uses a lot the same as what we saw in the other gun. The rear ring releases and the front ring is a rotary dovetail. The rear ring slips out by manipulation of a leader, uh, lever, with a scope attached, this whole arrangement would pivot and the front ring would disengage, leaving the open sights for a dangerous game or when it was needed. We'll also cover a little bit, especially since we have this gun available, metal finishes. You notice the mottled look, the blues, the browns, the straw colors, in the receiver, in the scope rings, and even in the bolt itself. This is color case hardening. For years and years, this was done not only for decoration, but also for wearability. Case hardened steel is much, much harder than mild steel. So you get two hard parts sliding against one another. It's extremely slick. Now if we can just get the color on this nice extractor, this is called niter bluing. Niter bluing, it's an electric blue. It really shows up vividly. On this particular gun, the small parts on the rear scope mount and the extractor is niter blued and it lends a very, very beautiful touch. We'll go into a little bit here of stock furniture. What you're seeing now is a stock reinforcement bolt. This bolt, this piece of solid steel, runs all the way through the stock, just behind the magazine box. There's also one up on the front edge. This reinforcing bolt holds the stock together under hard recoil. All magazine rifles are weak or the weakest point anyway is around the magazine box where the stock is the thinnest. Under heavy recoil the stock tends to spread. These reinforcement bolts hold the stock together. I'll shift up to the front one so that's also there. This gun sports a different checkering pattern than what we saw in the last also. This is a fleur-de-lis The fleur de lis pattern, which is French, is a very, very popular pattern and traditional in many, many guns. This particular gun has an extra of having an internal ribbon that runs through the checkering pattern. A very complicated pattern, this one very well done. I'll rotate around and show the bottom. Where the internal ribbons run into the fleur de lis, the fleur de lis runs into the checkering and points back toward the front tang screw. I'm going to roll it up this way just so we can look at some inletting. Very, very tight. The inletting here is, of course, perfect. This, by the way, is a Model 70 Winchester action of the pre-64 variety. Another very, very popular action. The last rifle we had was a 98 Mauser. This gun or this action incorporates a lot of the same features of the 98 Mauser. Control feed, something very necessary for big game, for a dangerous game. 
control feed, long extractor, the three position safety, of course, made famous by the Winchester Model 70. Notice a color case hardening here, even on the safety and the bolt knob. The fleur de lis pattern on the grip, again with the internal ribbons. Rotating up to show the treatment on the grip cap. Also steel and engraved. Let me say just a little bit here about stock wood. This is also, of course, French walnut or Circassian walnut, English walnut, whatever you'd like to call it, but it's thin shell, royal walnut. Notice the fire in the fiddle back there, the grain. You've got the dark streaks, dark streaks of the mineral, mineralization in the wood showing the color, but also these are mineral streaks here, but also crossways to that, we have what is called a fiddleback, which are stress wrinkles in the wood. The tree automatically uh, compensates for stress put on it, and it forms this beautiful grain. As you move the wood around, you get flashes of, of reflected light from inside the wood grain. Here we get an overall view of the buttstock. Again, a perfect layout. We hadn't discussed that yet, but layout means that the grain is running in a strong direction where there's no danger of splitting through the stock. And then back on the end that the shooter has to deal with, on this heavy caliber, 416 Remington in this case, we have a recoil pad, an absorbing pad, but it's been covered with leather. It's a traditional treatment, difficult to do correctly. This one, of course, is done correctly. The rear sling swivel, again, on the little pad, the little island. It's a very, very strong system. It's not just one wood screw screwed into the stock and hope it holds. These sling swivels are held in by two wood screws and also inletted in to show even more strength or give more strength. Now, as you notice through a little video voodoo, we've turned the gun around so you can see the cheek piece. Cheek pieces have traditionally been for support of the face, and they're handy for that. They're also beautiful. It shows the stock maker's skill in making lines blend together. And what we're talking about here really is sculpture. It's usable sculpture. It's good overall view of the checkering pattern there with the internal ribbons. The reinforcement stock bolts. Just looking at the left side of this fine pre-war Model 70 Winchester that's been changed completely around into a dangerous game gun. The fore end, you notice, has a lot of checkering. A lot of checkering on it. That's to get hold of it. You need to. Again, the ebony four end tip for a contrast to the stock. We want to pull back now and get an overall view of a superbly done dangerous game gun. As promised, good close-ups of excellent engraving with a gold elephant as a centerpiece.
This is called a straddle floor plate, by the way, as we're panning. The gold elephant is 24 karat gold inlaid into the steel. Color case hardened again. All of the action parts of this particular gun are color case hardened. Beautiful work. As we've explained before, every gun, custom made gun, is made for one customer. In this instance here, this gun we're going to talk about is kind of unusual. It's much different than other big heavy calibers we've seen. This is an open sight only 375. It's not set up for a scope at all. Built on a pre-64 Model 70, actually a pre-war Model 70, as shown by the cloverleaf tank. Drop box magazine, full optic and barrel with an integral top rib, open sights, one standing, one folding. We'll show close-ups of the whole thing. I want to kind of explain about this gun. I said in the segment on wood that we always use thin shell walnut. We always use English or Circassian. Well, this is an exception. This is Bastone. Bastone is a, well, Bastone means bastard. It's a cross between thin shell English and the native Claro walnut uh, of California. It shows a lot of the grain structure of Claro, but it shows the hardness and the workability of fine English. It's a mixture. It's a very fine wood. It's uh, fairly easy to work, beautiful. And you notice the grain, the layout grain of this stock. This stock is beautiful all the way through, quarter sawn. The grain structure is running right up through the grip, all the way out the fore end, in just a perfect flow. You also notice that the mineral, the mineralization or the dark lines that show the grain run true to the grain. Now, this is getting complicated here. This is a technical point that we uh, try to point out every chance we get. In Claro and the Bastone and the Paradox Walnuts, which is another cross of Bastone, the mineral marks 99.9% .9 of the time run with the true grain of the wood. You can tell the way the grain runs by where the mineral marks are. In English Walnut, in the thin shell English walnuts, this is not always the case. You can get the black marbling or mineral marks that run almost directly across the grain, just depending on how that mineralization was absorbed into the wood. It's an oddball point, but it's one worth noting. Also on heavy calibers, the big heavy kickers with a big stout stiff barrel we're not so concerned about how the grain runs through the fore end of the stock. On a lightweight sporter, you want a stable stock with a grain running slightly uphill, just slightly up to the barrel. On a big heavy caliber, it's a customer or a stock maker's call of how that grain runs. Sometimes we uh, sacrifice a little bit of stability and gain a lot of beauty without sacrificing accuracy. This particular gun, we'll get some real close-ups here, <clears throat> has fine line matting done by the engraver up on the top. Like I say, there's no scope mounts, no provisions for a scope except some drill and tap holes. Somebody should probably be shot if they wanted to mount a scope on this gun. The stock itself, the design of the stock, the butt stock is lower in profile. That gives a, uh, a lower line of sight. It's got a little bit of a cast off, which we've explained. The center line of the butt stock is cast away from the center line of the bore. It's, uh, it's set up to be an iron sight gun, and nothing but an iron sight gun. This gun's also light. I would estimate without having a scale handy, I'd think eight and three quarters, maybe nine pounds. Uh, in 375 H&H, &H, I'm sure you don't have to open the bolt to find out if it went off. This is the cloverleaf tang I was talking about, designates a pre-war Model 70. Also notice the little fine line engraving all the way around the outline of the metal. 
just a little fine line. That much engraving adds so much to a gun. It really is well worth the money. A small amount of engraving adds a tremendous amount to any rifle. Also on top of the bridge here, notice the treatment there that the engraver has done. Little fine line border, and then the very fine matting where you see the two scope mount screws there. A little checkerboard pattern with shading in one corner. That keeps down the light reflection on an open sight gun. You don't want any glint in your eyes. Just a very nice piece all the way. We've also got the little fine line matting on the front rib, on the front ring, I mean, and leading into a plain rib. Real neat little barrel here. Full octagon with an integral top rib. Makes a continental style sporting rifle out of it. You notice on most every heavy rifle we have shown, it's got a lot of checkering on the forehand. You need a lot to grab hold to. Flirt leaf pattern here, internal ribbon. Very nicely done. Look at the shadow lines. Shows up very well on this gun. Even where the internal ribbon runs across the pattern, the shadow lines still run true right across that ribbon. That shows that all of the lines were perfectly parallel. Nice flirt -lee on the bottom. I have to call the inletting to your attention here. An octagon barrel has parallel sides. It's extremely hard to inlet tight. This one is done. Very, very tight. Ebony four-end tip. A little aside here on an ebony four-end tip. Most people think it's decoration only. I did for years. Come to find out by doing a little bit of research that the early rifle makers used ebony or horn to seal the end grain. That was before the days of urethane finishes. So they used a, a more stable material and glued it onto the end grain to keep moisture from going in. Here's an integral sling swivel. Integral meaning it's made as part of the barrel. Again, it's out forward of the forend tip, so the, the rifle, as it's slung, is below your hat line. It doesn't snag up on the brush. Integral front ramp, European-style square bead. This is a real good view here of European style express sights, continental style, if you will. The one standing leaf is in the center, and then there's two folding leaves, one to the rear here that represents 200 yards, and the one in the front that flips up to represent 300 yards. So you've got a fixed center sight for 100, 100 yards here, 200, and 300. This sight is nicely inletted into the top rib of the barrel. You have windage adjustment left and right by drift, and then the flip up leaves that are cut by the gun maker are cut to zero the gun at the ranges indicated. Also notice I have a little fine line gold inlaid into the sight that draws the eye to the, the notch for the bead. It is said that on sailboats and camping trailers, storage is at a premium. Also on big game rifles. The old time hunters and gun makers find out a way to store things by putting a neat little trap door in the butt plate. This particular one is bored to accept three cartridges. Therefore, you're never without ammo when you got your gun with you. A lot of people think that's really neat, and I do too. I had to show this. This is an example of checkering at its very, very best. 
here we have the area under the grip, just behind the rear tang screw. There's a rear tang screw to give you a perspective of where we are. With this close-up lens, it's very, very hard to keep our focus right. But you notice the, the dividing line between the checkering patterns. I'll try to point this out. Right there, there's a dividing line between the checkering patterns. And the result of that is you actually get little half diamonds. It takes a good checker indeed to keep those diamonds sharp and square and looking right. Understand also that this camera has more magnification than the original maker used by Bill and the Gun. Here's a very good view of a skeleton grip cap. Call it skeleton. It's uh, made out of steel, of course, and is inleted into the wood where the wood is flush with the steel. I get my big finger in there to give you some kind of a scale. Then the, the center portion there is checkered to match the rest of the stock. This particular skeleton grip cap is engraved to match the floor plate. I want to show an overall view of the bottom of this nice 375, starting with a blued trapdoor grip cap, or butt plate, excuse me, to the French grade sling swivel, French grade and engraved skeleton grip cap, the beautiful fleur-de-lis checkering pattern into an engraved and French grade bottom metal trigger guard and floor plate, showing a very nice bull elk. Again, the engraving showing what the gun is for. And then into the fore end checkering, which of course matches the grip section. Everything matches. Everything goes together. Everything is a part of a whole. This is what really denotes a custom rifle. This is a best quality custom rifle. Everything fits. Everything is as it should be. It's small attention to detail that really sets apart a best quality gun from the ordinary. It's graceful in line. Its purpose is demonstrated with the engraving. The function is demonstrated by the design. Even the cheek piece. Very nicely done, graceful, showing the lines of the gun to best advantage. Right down to the finely fi fitted trapdoor butt plate. We in the guild are often asked what accessories are available to offset or to, to show off your fine custom gun the best. Here we have a fine leather case and a shotgun. And we'll go over some of these accessories. We also get asked, what are fine guns like this worth? What do you have to pay for a fully engraved custom L.C. Smith 20 gauge shotgun with all accessories and a leather case? In this case, the owner of this gun paid $20. He paid $20 for a raffle ticket. This is one of the annual Gill projects. A metal worker and a stock maker contracted together to build this gun to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Gill. One of these a year are done at the annual exhibition it's given to the lucky winner for a $20 ticket. Here we have a French fitted case with ultra suede lining. The shotgun, of course, is nestled into it. The barrels at, uh, up above here and under the barrels is an ebony cleaning rod with brass fixtures, turn screws, and a chamber brush with a cover so the chamber brush doesn't dirty up the case. 
I've often been asked, what's the difference between turn screws and screwdrivers? About a hundred bucks a piece. Oil bottle, buffalo horn patch case, and buffalo horn and brass snap caps to protect the firing pins. With this gun also, we want to explain some of the metal finishes. Starting up at the top here with uh, the fine rust blued barrels. Rust bluing has always been traditional in double guns, also in fine custom rifles. Explanation about rust bluing is based on an oxidized process. If you consider that burning of fuel is oxidation, we're doing the same thing with steel. You can oxidize the surface and card off that oxidation. What is already rusted is very difficult to rust again. So think of it as charring a piece of wood and smoothing off that charred finish to a very low luster, velvety, smooth, even luster. That charred finish, which is what we're calling oxidized steel, is very, very tough, resilient, and rust proof. Most all fine custom guns now use a rust blued finish for steel parts, except here again we have color case hardening. Color case hardening on this particular gun in conjunction with the 24 karat gold inlay is extremely beautiful. We've got bright, even colors, it's a random pattern of blues and straw and amber and every color of the, of the color case hardening rainbow. A very, very beautiful finish here. It just offsets and highlights the 24 karat gold setter with a, the flying pheasant. You notice these pins here are gold plated. These pins are part of the lock mechanism. Inside this lock, the parts are gold washed to prevent rust on the inside of the lock plate. The triggers here, niter blued. Niter being saltpeter. The triggers are soaked in a solution of melted saltpeter, which melts at a very specific temperature. It creates this vivid electric blue that really offsets other colors. Moving up to the turn screws, here again we have the niter blue with a polished surface of the turn screw. Niter blue, polished steel, brass, and ebony. All classic colors, very beautifully done. There are times that every custom gun maker really looks forward to. A client will come to him and say, shoot the works. Do your best job. Do anything you can think of to make a better job. Let's have a truly custom gun. Price is no object. This is a good example of custom metal work. This particular gun in 375 H and H, it follows the lines of the classic express rifle. It was actually built from two separate Model 98 receivers. It was cut apart and welded back together as extra length. The magazine box made from scratch, extra length for the 375 Holland and Holland. Notice extended tangs. Extended tangs bottom and top. We will here in a few minutes pull real close-ups on this whole job and show just what can be done with custom metal work. The top tang, you notice, is in the same shape as the top line of the stock. This will be inletted into the top line of the stock. It's a reinforcing. It's also extremely difficult to do from a metal working standpoint and a stock making standpoint. It is difficult to inlet these little fine pieces, even if you successfully make the fine pieces. It extends up over the comb and reinforces the complete grip area 
of the rifle. The bottom tang conforms to the pistol grip contour. It goes down and engages with the grip cap. This ties the action with the top of line of the stock and the bottom metal into the grip cap. A very, very good feature. Hard to do, difficult. This one done so good, it's just nearly unbelievable. Next, we're gonna try to pull a very close up of the trigger. When we say custom, in this instance, this is really custom. The man that ordered this gun is right-handed. We can tell that by the trigger. Notice that the trigger is actually slanted for a right-hand shooter. This way. The trigger now is slanted properly for the right trigger finger. If you go around the other side, you've got a ridge there instead of the flat of the trigger. A right-hand trigger. Let's pull back now and get the rear sight, the rear bridge. Right here. This gun has three different sighting systems. The pointer now is on a small rear receiver sight or peep sight that's adjustable for windage it's also quick detachable. Now, I'll try to demonstrate this. There's a button on the, the left side of the receiver ring. You push the button in and the sight lifts out. Just like that. This is made, of course, from bar stock from scratch. So that sight is a quick removable sight. It actually engages in what otherwise serves as the rear scope base for claw type scope mounts. Now moving forward up the action, this way, there's the front scope base here with the two legs for the, the holes for the legs of the claw base, the claw mount, into the quarter rib, into a three leaf express sight, marked 50, 100, and 200. We'll flip up the sight here to show they lay flush, but flip up under spring tension and lock in place. That's a 50-yard sight. For a 100-yard sight, and for a 200-yard sight. Each leaf is finely matted on top and labeled for yardage with a gold line inlaid into the V for quicker sighting. In keeping for a heavy rifle, under heavy recoil, we have here an accessory recoil lug. This is silver soldered to the bottom of the barrel. The rear surface is at 90 degrees to the line of the bore, and this is inletted into the stock, not visible from the outside, of course but it serves as a secondary recoil lug. It actually doubles the amount of steel against the wood to further take recoil. Working up the barrel, we've got a barrel band sling swivel. Again, for a heavy rifle, this keeps the left hand away from the sling and the swivel. It doesn't bite you. Further up, we have a banded ramp front sight the very nice ivory bead engraved and matted on top. This in 375. An absolutely beautiful work. Now for some real magic, we've got a fast stock maker and he's going to stock this. 
just that quick. Most customers have to wait longer. This is, of course, a different gun. You'll notice that in the pistol grip section, there is a difference as a shotgun guard instead of the Orbendorf style. Finely checkered bolt knob with an optic in route to the bolt knob. The claw mounts on top, claw scope mounts, quick lever detachment with a, a uh, plug in top to stop up the hole so you don't have the hole showing up on top. Very neat little feature. Let's work back here to the extended rear tang. This will show real well. There is the extended rear tang up over the comb of the stock. Notice a nice little flur on the end, attached by a screw. The screw is niter blued. The rest of the metal work is either color case hardened or rust blued. Notice the contrast with the niter blued screw and the rust blued tang. Very pure, pretty. Look at the shadow lines in the check ring there. I just noticed that on the monitors we're making this. That is superb check ring. The shadow lines run absolutely straight top to bottom. Trying to keep in focus while we're doing this, we'll notice the extended rear tang, or bottom tang, that goes into the grip cap. This happens to be a trap grip cap. This is, this is traditional for a heavy rifle. Generally an extra front sight bead is kept there or any small tools that the rifle may need. Very nicely done, color case hardened. I'd like to say something too about the color of this stock. We can pull away just a little and notice the overall reddish tone to the stock. This is also traditional, especially for English style rifles. It's got a little bit of a reddish stain at the risk of pronouncing it wrong. I call it alkanet root, alkanet root stain. More color. Let's get a little color. We've got niter blued safety lever. Niter blued there. Color case hardened shroud and safety body. Rust blued bolt handle here. And moving forward on the action, we come into a niter blued extractor. Trying to get the color correct on that. I can't get that color. Oh, look at there. Can we get blue out of that? Onto the front receiver ring. This is a square bridge type action. Again, the quick attachable scope mount on top has been plugged with a finely engraved and color case hardened cover that covers up the hole for the quick attachable scope mount. Then we've got the beginning of the quarter rib, a very, very nice quarter rib, too. Finely sculptured and matted. This is in 404 Nitro Express. Moving on forward, 
a nice scroll leading into a standing rear sight. Label 50 yards and then a flip up rear sight for 100 and 200 and 300. This may be the best photos we've got yet of a real nice rust blue. It's a soft satin rust blue that it doesn't show glossy. It's just a very, very fine finish. This is a very, very fine rifle. Let's pull back a little bit and get an overall view of the checker and pattern there. We've got a point pattern, Mueller borders. Again, the shadow lines show up here real good. Shadow lines running 90 degrees to the, to the barrel line. Notice the treatment on the front tang there, the, uh, the front of the bottom tang is pointed instead of rounded. Color case hardened floor plate and a lever plate release, niter blued. Call a lever plate instead of inside the bow and a nicely sculptured steel shotgun style guard. And again, we have a right hand trigger. Maybe we can show that. Trigger is made for a right hand shooter. Great rifle. All the way back to a necessary part a very necessary part of a 404 Nitro. And that again is a leather covered pad. It's time now to start looking at parts and pieces, accessories, things that we're going to use to put together your custom gun. Not one that's already done, but just show you some of the options. And believe me, these are not all of the options. There's a lot of options. A good metalsmith creates from whole cloth or billet steel what you want or what he feels is, is correct, uh, what you need for your uh, particular application. But we do have some parts and pieces here, even some actions that will give you an idea of what's possible anyhow in the realm of gun making. This particular action is made from bar stock. That's from scratch. Now you notice it has the, the lines of Winchester Model 70, of the pre-64 model. You've got the long extractor, it's control feed, Model 70 bolt knob, Model 70 safety. It does have custom looking bottom metal, more of the modern classic era. This is not a Model 70. It was made from scratch, out of, out of bar stock. It's also shorter than any Model 70 made up to date. It's a short to medium action for 243, 308 length. It can be had right or left handed. It can be had with a bolt face to fit the triple deuce family of cartridges or PPC or standard, makes no difference. The custom gun maker, the custom metalsmith will make whatever you want. is in the custom gun industry, seven pound rifles are difficult to make. Seven and a quarter pound aren't bad at all. Once you get below seven pounds, guns cost many dollars per ounce. Every rifle maker that make lightweight mountain rifles are looking for ways to save weight. This bolt knob saves weight. It's hollow. It's just a shell of steel, 
checkered, of course, and engraved on the bottom. But it's actually an ounce, just about an ounce lighter than a standard bolt knob. This particular one is gold inlaid and finely checkered. Custom guns are for the customer. If the customer prefers a single shot for any number of reasons, we may start with something like this, a turn of the century Winchester high wall, single shot action. This is unmodified except for a minor amount of work being done on the breech face, but as a whole, this is an original action. Single shots have several advantages, one being that you can have more barrel length without increasing the length of the complete rifle. Now to give you an idea of what may be done in order to make a custom rifle out of the single shot action, we use one of about the same period by the same maker and change it considerably. First, notice that the rear tangs, the top tang and the bottom tang, has been altered. Again, show you the original. We have altered this by putting a block between. This makes a, a stronger stock attaching system because now we can use a through bolt and not depend on the tang screws as a pinch system as original. Also easier to put a pistol grip stock on the shorter tang. We can come into a pistol grip without having to re-bend the lower tang. The front of the receiver up here has been extended. Again, a comparison. The extended front receiver portion gives a better line across the front. Reinforcement for the attachment of the forehand and even an unthreaded portion here for the butt of the barrel to go into. This particular action up on top has a roughed out scope mount or scope base that will later be machined for a scope mount. Everything is in, in the case of any custom metal work has been stoned flat, all of the sharp edges and polished to perfection. Fine example here of a custom single shot rifle. English walnut stock, nice graceful cheek piece. And as we were saying, here's a 26 inch barrel in a very compact, nice little rifle. Very nice and compact. Here again, we'll point out a metal finish the receiver is French grade. It's a very good contrast with the 24 karat gold and the little family of foxes on the side. French gray is an acid process that etches the surface and does serve as a rust preventative. Very nice finish. Years ago, everybody made everything from scratch. If you wanted a real fine sight, you had to make it. Now, more and more people are, are set up to make very, very fine custom featured accessories for sale to the trade. This particular one is a real nice little island ramp rear sight that's adjustable for, wind, for elevation by turning the, the hand wheel knob here. You notice it climbing the ramp. That's elevation adjustment. It's dovetailed so you have a side to side or a lateral movement for windage adjustment. And then there's a lock screw on the front, on the side here visible, that locks everything into place. This can be fitted to your barrel and you have a standing leaf, extremely nice, clean rear sight. In conjunction with it, maybe a banded front sight. You'll notice these are rough. 
They're rough machined for a purpose. They will be finished by the metalsmith the way you want them. At times, on the back, like for instance, on the lead-in portion of the ramp here, this will be contoured into a, a design or a figure that matches the front of the quarter rib, possibly. Even barrel band sling swivels at times are, are sculptured. Scope mounts are sculptured to match. I always try to match where you've got a very, very nice overall picture, an overall job on a gun. I want to insert here also that in the custom gun business, alloys other than alloy steel have no place. To make a lightweight rifle, steel is used and fine walnut. There's no excuse in a custom gun for aluminum or zinc or die cast alloys. Everything is steel. Very interesting feature on this ramp front sight here. You notice there's a, there's a groove here cut for the hood. We saw that on another gun in another segment where you've got a hood that protects the front sight. This particular ramp has a plunger here that locks the hood in place. It's a spring-loaded plunger. The hood slides on and has a notch that this detent engages into, so you can't lose the hood by dragging it through the brush. We consider custom guns as usable art. Usable art. Everything is form and function. Let's go into some stock furniture. We've got here what is referred to as a skeleton butt plate. And we'll see photos of this on finished guns. This is a rough one. This is the way that the, the stock maker would buy this particular accessory. It's made by a gill member, of course. It's steel. Very well formed in line. Got a little widow's peak on top there that inlets into the top line of the stock. This is inletted onto the butt plate or the butt portion of the rifle to where the, the wood comes up level with the level of the, of the metal. So the steel and wood is flush. Then generally the wood is finely checkered inside. And we'll see some examples of that on finished rifles. Now let's look here. We've got this one, and here's another one. Notice the similarity. They're both skeleton butt plates, but notice a different pattern. Notice a different pattern on the skeleton. Well, that's not the only pattern you can have. You can make your own butt plate and cut any pattern you like. These patterns can transfer into engraving, into the checkering pattern, into the pattern of other metal accessories like sling swivels or barrel band swivels, front sight bands. It's really, uh, it's an ongoing process and there's an infinite number of combinations that can be used to create a distinctive firearm. One of cover a little furniture here, stock furniture. We'll start out with sling swivels. You noticed on several of the guns we have shown you and going to show you, there's inletted sling swivels inletted into the stock. This is a good classic design right here, held in by two screws each. Another variation, this one, has a more of an arched look to it. A little more streamlined, a little more graceful for a lighter weight rifle. Then we've got a real neat one here, about the same design except the screws are hidden. So there's no screw heads to line up north and south. These up here, the top of the screen is more of a European stud style. One machine screw, one wood screw. Machine screw, of course, for the fore end, the wood screw for the buttstock. This is more of the old, uh, the English express rifle style, ball style, open hook, some people call them. All of them very well done, very nicely done. 
all of these sling swivels are designed to be used front and rear in the stock. The sling swivel pictured here is more the English style, the barrel band swivel. This is designed to bore out the same taper as a barrel, a good tight fit, and then solder it in place or sweat it in place. This swivel would be used in conjunction with a rear swivel of this design since the arch of the swivel is the same. This of course using the two attaching screws or that design which is a screwless that has the same arch. Another way to go with a barrel type swivel if you want one to fit on the barrel would be this little pad design. This is more the European or continental style. Now this one is made, these are all rough parts by the way, but this is made to put in the milling vise and then mill or file the radius on the bottom and then that is silver soldered or sweated to the barrel. Any of these uh, styles are very, very nice and makes a trim application. Pictured here is a skeleton grip cap. We saw one pictured on, on a heavy rifle. This is just a little ring of steel machined out of solid bar stock, two attaching screw holes. This is generally inleted. It has about a three degree draft on the inside here so it gets tighter as it goes down onto the wood. Once it's set down flush with the wood, then the maker can arch this gently, more like a regular grip cap, leave it flat, whatever he wants to do. These are made in a variety of patterns, even fleur de leaves, all kinds of nifty little things, just depending on how complicated someone wants to get. Another grip cap is the trap grip cap. This particular trap grip cap has a uh, a screw type cap on it designed to be taken off with a coin. The hole under the grip cap would be bored directly into the wood and used for storage of an extra front sight, a rear sight in some instances, uh, spare parts. Some people have a small turn screw or an allen screw for adjustment of a scope ring possibilities are just about endless. Another grip, trap grip cap we have, the integral type trap grip cap, this is, I think they call it the Holland style or the Jeffrey style, where the grip cap itself, all made out of a piece of steel of course, and it's self-contained. Cute little spring operated lid. And this is big enough for a variety of things. Extra front sights has always been kind of the favorite. You could even have a survival map in there if you wanted to. This is attached, by the way, through a screw hole in the bottom. So you've got a screw that uh, uh, goes down into the bottom of the cap. We'll cover some sights. First is a one standing, one folding sight. This sight has a dovetail front and rear to dovetail into the rib. This is a very, very popular sight. You notice this leaf does not fold all the way down. It doesn't right now. Once the V or the notch is cut in by the maker to zero the gun in both sights, then he very carefully inlets the metal in the base here for the fold down sight where it will fold down into the, the base of the sight and fit flush. So right now it's just roughly fitted. This sight, a lot the same, 
except it is adjustable for elevation. This is a one standing sight adjustable for elevation. It's a very small hole. Try to get this on camera. Very small hole here in the top that has an adjustment screw and the sight blade actually travels up and down. So you get an elevation adjustment out of it. The next sight is a simplest style, just a dovetail single standing leaf. Very simple, very strong, no moving parts. All of this gear is made by guild members for the trade to save a lot of time, effort, and machinery. A lot of people do some metal work, but they don't want to have a big expensive milling machine sitting around just for making these small parts. On computer control equipment, you can turn these parts out very inexpensively. The last sight I'm going to show, I'll leave those right there. This is just cute as anything I've ever seen. This is a receiver sight or peep sight adjustable for windage through a cross dovetail. Got a removable peep. This sight is designed to fit on the dovetail rear scope ring. It has a half inch 45 dovetail. So this actually fits on the rear scope base, mounting base, and is an extra sight in case the scope should be disabled or lost. Very cute accessory right there to fit inside your trap grip cap, don't you think? Next are scope rings. These are quick detachable lever type scope rings. The lever on the side here, by rotation of 90 degrees, it loosens the dovetail and the scope slides right off the base. These are machined out of solid bar stock, very, very strong, extremely repeatable, especially if a scope base is built on the gun. The receiver of the rifle is set up in the milling machine. The raw steel is screwed to the top of the receiver. Then the dovetails are cut both at the same time with the receiver in the vise of the milling machine. That makes the dovetails absolutely perfectly parallel with the bore line. They're extremely accurate, extremely strong. These can be fit on the strongest kickers the heaviest recoiling of rifles and still hold their zero. These rings are also offered by several makers without the lever, just with a like a hex head screw. They're less expensive that way. They're not as easy to take off. But if you put a hex wrench in your trapdoor grip cap, you have a ready way to take them off. Hard little gizmo here to show. This is a stock through bolt, a reinforcement bolt for heavy kickers. We've seen these on a couple of guns. A little spanner wrench in each end, a threaded rod in the middle. This goes through the stock and holds the stock together under heavy recoil. Again, a small part for years and years, makers have been making them themselves if the customer wanted them. The aftermarket members are making these. It's uh, much easier for us to buy than it is to make them. Another accessory made by the aftermarket people saves a lot of time and aggravation to the custom stock maker. We have guns that are called blind box magazines. 
For years and years, people used an 1898 Craig trigger guard to put on the bottom of a plain bottom stock. No magazine box, per se, or no floor plate that shows beneath uh, the stock. This machine from Solid Bar Stock has a starter hole in it for the trigger slot. The trigger slot can be cut for whatever width trigger. Drill and countersink for a tang screw. And to accompany this accessory, there's an escutcheon for the front, for the front tang screw. These have always been just a bear to make by hand. An oval or a parabolic oval is very, very hard to make by hand. Using CNC milling equipment is fairly easy, it's inexpensive, much less aggravation. On so many guns pictured in this tape, we have custom bolt knobs. Every one in the tape has a custom bolt knob if it's a bolt action rifle. This bolt knob is turned out of free machining steel like a 1018 or an L45, uh, 11 L45, I think the name of it is. Turned on a tracer lathe. This bolt knob is ready now to be checkered, or as you've seen in some, hollowed out with another cap made and TIG welded in place and reshaped for a hollow bolt knob, checkered, engraved, gold inlaid, anything you want to do. Then the big end here is parted off or cut off with a hacksaw, and it's welded usually by heliarch or gas, oxacetylene is welded onto the military bolt or commercial bolt, shaped out and polished. We're getting toward the end of this project. Not the end of the tape, however. We have attempted to show you, the customer, how you, the customer, are the designer of your gun. To this, from scrap iron, we got scrap iron, nice G3340, small ring, extra lightweight. You need a barrel, there's a barrel, 270, almost ready to go. All it takes is a craftsman's touch and your input on what you want. You are the final decider of what you're going to end up with. Now what we're going to do on this tape, I'm going to show you an address, who to contact, where to go for more information. Every year we have a beautiful show over a hundred of the first class custom gun builders in the world show up to show their work. These guns you've seen on the tape, the ones to follow the address on the latter part of the tape, uh, they'll be there. The engravers, Fireman Engravers Guild of America, come and have a joint show. We invite you please to come and look at this stuff for yourself. Talk to the makers. We don't bite. Remember, after the address, we've got some more pictures for those of you that hadn't had enough. And remember also, life is too short to shoot an ugly gun. Very nice Parker shotgun here, restocked, unusual, and it's checkered and carved. Very nice bolt action rifle here. This is one of the $20 yearly giveaway guns that the guild does every year. Another of the guild giveaway guns called Valley of the Dolls, the engraving pattern on the bottom there, there was an oil painting of that same scene that went with the gun. Another guild rifle, a shortened 98 Mauser and 253,000. Look at the engraving and the unusual rear sight treatment on this gun and the checkering pattern. Ruger number one is becoming more and more popular. This is a very fine example.
another Ruger number one. Flush gold inlays, two inlays in the side of the receiver, and cased. Still another number one. Notice that on each one of these, the quarter rib has been replaced with a custom quarter rib, as well as stock and engraved. The old high wall Winchester, still a favorite after all of these years. Very nice turn bolt action here. Looks to be maybe a 300 H and H. This is the blind box magazine here. It makes a very light and trim rifle. Save some weight in the bottom metal, floor plate, etc. Over and under browning here, restock, engraved, French grade, and rust blued. Look at the checkering pattern on this one with a very long internal ribbon and a fleur de lis checkering pattern. Here's a matched pair that are not truly matched, possibly a his and hers. The next picture also the same gun. These look very, very similar with the same checkering pattern, obviously wood out of the same tree, but the engraving is different. Very nice pair. This is a single shot made completely from scratch, lock, stock, and barrel. This made for a small girl by one of our members. Big bore bolt action here. Square rear bridge, quarter rib, drop box magazine. The old English Ferguson, one of the first of the real successful single shots. Very popular and scarce. Another Ferguson, even bigger. These make excellent projects, but they're so hard to get that there are not many of them done now. Another Ferguson. Notice a decocking lever on the right side. Relieve the tension on the mainspring. Here's another single shot. This is the Martini Cadet, the little training rifle of the British Army and the Australians, made into a very fine sporter. This is an unusual treatment here that you don't see much anymore as a side-mounted scope. Still very useful, but just kind of fallen out of favor in later years. This is a Model 63 Winchester, restocked and grade, color case hardened. Made into a nice little 22 rimfire semi-auto. Very fine double shotgun here. And a pair of double shotguns. Notice the checkering here, much more extensive and better than even the best quality of the English guns. Another pair of doubles, done in lighter English walnut. This is probably wood from California. This is a target rifle, heavier barrel with a big scope. You notice a thicker comb, a little higher target of varmint. This is a very nice and trim here, very nice and trim. This is shortened bottom metal here from a shortened Mauser action. Gold inlaid, engraved, and French grade around the gold. Makes a nice treatment. This is a very trim little lightweight mountain rifle here. Unusual treatment on a skeleton butt plate here with an ebony insert in the skeleton.
Very nice gun here. Gold inlay, French grade, big game rifle for sure. Sculptured scope range. Another big game rifle without a quarter rib. Got an island rear sight. One standing in a couple folding. Another big game rifle with an unusual action. This is not a Mauser, not a Model 70, not a single shot. Another very trim rifle here with an unusual checkering pattern. Point on the rear, fleur -de on the front. Don't see that much, but it worked here. I think this is a sheep rifle. Another view of a Model 63 Winchester, becoming more popular with the custom makers. Very trim gun here with a wooden grip cap. Unusual nowadays, most everything is steel. Another sheep rifle, I just about bet on it. This is a double shotgun on the engraver's bench, in process. Look at the checkering pattern on this. Somebody had a lot of extra time on their hands. It's a left-handed, I believe a Kimber. Restocked, makes a very nice trim little custom rifle. This is a very streamlined Winchester Model 70 here. Notice the low comb. It makes for very racy lines. There's another low comb gun that, uh, I call them 60 mile an hour guns. They look like they're going 60 when they're sitting still. Very nice shot here of a left hand for a left hand shooter. Left hand bolt action, left hand cheek piece. This is a very good shot here. Some fantastic wood and a nice stocking job on a Winchester Model 21. Beaver tail four in, Burl English. There's a Ruger number one unusual checkering uh, engraving pattern with a French grade receiver. Looks very nice. This is another Martini. Little Martini Cadet single shot. Quarter rib that extends back over the receiver. An unusual gun here that it has a